Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, you guys, this is Pastor Leslie here, the lead pastor of Church of the Holy Spirit Song. And I just want to thank Mo for the reading of the scripture today. And there may be some questions that you have in there when you hear that scripture read. Some of it might not make sense to you, but let me start with a question for you first. Have you ever thought that you really don't have a significance in this world? Have you ever thought that you don't belong? Or have you ever thought that maybe you don't have the same place in life as other people? Or that you don't mean anything? Or that your life is meaningless? Have you ever thought those things about yourself? Well, I think all of us have struggled with those in some sense of our lives or another, in one place or one time or another. I know I certainly have. And maybe you have too. But I want to give you an opportunity today to learn about how special you are to God and how God created you for a very special purpose. Well, have you ever wondered about your place in the world? Have you ever wondered why God put you here? I know it's a personal question, but before we can even begin to answer that on an individual level, we have to answer it on a larger level, on a bigger scale. What is the place of humankind in this world? Why are humans here and why do we matter? Why did God put us here? Because until we understand the place of humans in the world, the big picture, we can never understand our individual place in the picture. Well, Psalm 8 is a beautiful, beautiful hymn of praise to God. And it is smack in the middle of the very first book of Psalms. We're not going to go into a whole explanation of how the Psalms were sectioned out and how they were written and how they were placed together, but it is written by or associated some way to David. And David um, begins and ends the Psalm with these words of praise and acclamation, which you may have noticed were repeated exactly at the beginning of the Psalm and at the end of the song. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Because the psalm speaks of God's creation and the night sky in particular, it was probably sung quite often in evening worship beneath the very skies under which the words were originally composed. The psalm is written in the second person. David addresses God throughout the psalm, and as he speaks to God, David reflects both on on God's creation and on man's place or human's place in God's creation. So let's study this psalm together and as we do so we're going to seek to answer the question what does Psalm 8 teach us about our place in God's creation or God's majesty and me? How do they relate to each other? Well number one our very first point today and if you're taking notes on your phone or if you're taking notes in your uh, in your journal book that you have there. Number one, God is greater than all. I think we know that. Sometimes we forget in our lives though then. We get a little puffed up or a little big for ourselves. But God is greater than all. That's point number one. Well first of all, Psalm 8 teaches us that God is greater than all. And it says, in the beginning, God's name is majestic in all the earth. And as we've already seen, God's begin, uh, David begins and ends the psalm with these words, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. If you look at that verse closely in your Bible, you'll notice that there are two different representations of the word Lord found in this verse. The first one is Lord in all capital letters. And the second one is Lord with just the first letter capitalized. Those are two different names. This is the way most English Bible translations distinguish between the two different words for the word Lord in Hebrew. When you see the word Lord in actual all caps, that's the actual name of God. That is the name Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E as revealed to Moses at the burning bush. When God said, take off your sandals, the place you stand is holy ground. It is a name that speaks of God's self-existence in an eternal nature. When atheists and agnostics ask the question, who created God? Nobody created God. God has always been, always will be, and always was. 
When you see the word Lord, which is the first letter capitalized, that translates the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord or Master. Yahweh is God's personal name. Adonai is a title. So to break it down, Leslie is my personal name, but Pastor is my title. So when you say Pastor Leslie, you're saying my title and my name. Make sense? Okay, good. And so David addresses God in this psalm by both his personal name and his title. And he says, O Yahweh, our Lord and Master, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God's name, we've talked about this before, refers to his pers person and his nature, his character. So the character of God is, tra is in his name. The word majestic translates to a word that means great or glorious or excellent. When you think about the ways that you use the word majestic, you may think of um, high, high, beautiful, purple mountains uh, somewhere across the land or, or across the world or a majestic forest or something in that way. It means great or glorious or excellent. And so David is saying in this verse that there is no one place that you can go on earth where God's great power and glory cannot be seen. God is greater than all, first of all, because his name is majestic in all the earth. So God has set his glory above the heavens. Secondly, God is greater than all because he set his glory above the heavens. We see that in the second half of verse 1, you have set your glory above the heavens. God's glory and majesty not only fill the earth and the universe, his glory and majesty extend beyond the universe. God has set his glory not only in the universe, but in the universe, but above all created things. In other words, as great as the universe is, God is greater. As big as the universe is, God is bigger. King Solomon understood this. When Solomon dedicated the newly built temple, asking God to bless the temple with his presence, he prayed, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. That's 1 Kings 8, 27. God is not contained by the universe, just like he's not contained in this building. He has set his glory above the heavens. God is greater than all. And our third sub point in here is that God can silence his enemies even through the praises of little children? What? Yeah, it's right. God can silence his enemies even through the praises of little children. Now listen to this because this is really cool what happens in the Bible here. This is a third way that Psalm 8 teaches us that God is greater than all that is, than everything. God can silence his enemies even through the praises of little children. Look at verse 2 on your phone. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. God is not threatened in the least by his enemies. Now, I don't know about you, but I do feel threatened by my enemies. I don't think I have any enemies right now, but I have had enemies, and I'm sure there will be enemies in the future, and yes, I have felt threatened by them. But God is not threatened at all by his enemies. Even the praises of little children can defeat those who would attempt to stand against God in his ways. Now Jesus quoted this very verse when he was heading to the temple, healing in the temple, and children were proclaiming them, him as Messiah, shouting out, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna. Well, what they were saying was Hebrew, Hoshana, which means, um, please save us. Hoshana in Hebrew means, please save us. So they were shouting out, Hoshana to the son of David, please save us, son of David. And the chief priests and the, um, the teachers of the law were indignant at this because the children were shouting out to Jesus, calling him the son of David, and they were asking him to save them. And they said to Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Do you hear what they're saying out loud? And Jesus replied, yes, 
And then he quoted Psalm 8 too. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You have ordained praise. That's found in Matthew 21. So there is a hint here in Psalm 8 of the promise that was given to mankind, to humankind, when God cursed the serpent in the Garden of Eden. God told the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Through the procreation of children, a line was established that would eventually bring Messiah and bring a crushing defeat to Satan, the great enemy and foe of God. God's name, you guys, is majestic in all the earth. He has set his glory above the heavens. He can silence his enemies even through the praises of little children. The first thing that Psalm 8 teaches us is that our place in the universe, sorry, the first thing that Psalm 8 teaches us is about our place in the universe and that God is indeed greater than all. But we have a part in that greatness. Number two, write this down in your notes. Number two, the universe is big, we are small. Well, yeah, that is quite uh, an interesting point there, Pastor Les. I think I know that. The universe is big, we are so small. The second thing that Psalm 8 teaches us about our place in the universe is that the universe is a very, very big place. And in comparison, we are very, very small. Now, if you've been watching any of the news about the Mars rover, which I find absolutely fascinating, um, and they even have, um, NASA has some videos of Mars, the Mars rover and pictures that it's taken and sent back already to us for us to see. It's amazing. And to see the stars from there is incredible. Listen, as David looked up into the stars at night, he had some idea of how huge the universe was. But would he be absolutely, but he would be absolutely astounded by what we know of the size of the universe today. But that's, you know, for another day and another sermon. We have a much bigger grasp of the size of the universe than David did. So what effect should looking at God's creation and staring up in the heavens have on us today? This is the first sub point of the universe is big, we are small. A, the beauty of God's creation should cause us to worship the creator. And that is an amazing, wonderful thing that happens for me is when I see it beautiful places, like when Sandy and I went to New Zealand, to be with um, my sister Corey and her wife Verna. Just the beauty and the splendor that was there and it, it is just amazing. The color of the water and the islands and the mountains jutting up out of the water and those little tiny little blue penguins that were swimming around us one day when we were on the Cow Wow Mail Run. The color of the, of the, of the forestry and the Tasman Sea, to be there, to be in that sea, that ocean, and swim in it between New Zealand and Australia, only God could have created those places. Those things cause me to worship the Creator and to thank Him for that just awesomeness of what He created for us and gave to us. So we're going to talk about this more, but David touches on the same theme here in Psalm 8. Look at, at verse 3 where David says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers or the work of your hands. Now we know that God doesn't actually have fingers or hands. God is a spirit and he doesn't have a body. But this is a poetic way of David to describe God's intimate and personal act of creation. The world we live in was created by God. And even though it is stained and distorted by sin, we can actually still see the beauty of the Creator reflected in His creation. When you look at a painting, you see the person, uh, the personal touch that the painter put in that painting. You see some of their character being conveyed 
in that painting. When you hear a song being sung, you see the character of the writer of the song or, or the composer and, and the beauty of the singer that sings it and how they personally put their own touches on a song. This is something that God has done for us when he created the universe and the earth, the world for us. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to go away from the city out into the country where there's not a lot of light pollution and lay on your back on a blanket and stare up at the stars at night, it is, it's crazy what you can see. Um, another example we had just a, a couple of months ago was uh, where we could see, I can't remember which planet it is, type it in the notes there if you remember, but I think it was, um, I can't remember which planet we could see, but just as the sun was setting, just as, as um, the sun was setting and, and the darkness was coming upon the earth, you could see this planet out there, and it, it was crazy to see that thing just sitting up there in the sky and to know that it's so many hundreds of thousands or millions of miles away and there it is right there we could see it with our own naked eye that was awesome but these are the kind of things that David saw every night but the heavens are just one example of the beauty in God's creation think about all those things I talked about in New Zealand or, or any of the other wonderful places you've been some of the places I want to go are Alaska I want to go there I want to see killer whales I want to see the the icebergs and the glaciers and walk on them and and just see the beauty of that creation the blue ice that's amazing the way that light refracts and the ice that God's created I want to see um I want to go to uh, Brazil and see the rainforest there and see the wild birds flying through those are all parts of God's creation God created all of those beautiful things and all the beauty we see in God's creation should cause us to worship the Creator and to thank Him for what He's done for us. So subpoint B in this section of the universe is big and we are small is that the vastness of God's creation should cause us to consider our place in the universe. Okay? When David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what is man? David was considering this point B, point two of we are very small in this thing called creation. And it is an appropriate question for us to ask. What is planet Earth compared to all the stars and planets and the galaxies in the universe? I remember when I was in elementary school and they were teaching us the different sizes of all the planets and, and how they lay out and what order they were in. And please don't ask me to repeat that now because I have no clue what they are. But what is our place on in all this? And now we're coming to kind of part of the theme of our sermon. Why are we here? Why do we even matter? Are we alone in the universe or are there other life forms out there they're trying to find that out on Mars right now and I think it's a very apropos question for us but the bottom line is this we are not alone in the universe because God is there God is in the universe the sheer size of the universe can drive some people to despair or make them think that they're insignificant or that they don't matter. Because when it comes to the size of the universe, we really are nothing. But that doesn't mean that we are insignificant. And I want you to hear this. If you've ever felt or you're feeling now that you don't matter and you're insignificant, I want you to hear this now. Yes, the universe is very, very big and we are very, very small. But God has a specific place for all of us in this. That is the message of a vast universe. You are nothing without God. It is God who makes mankind, humankind significant in the universe. And so stay with me now because I want you to hear this part. This is subpoint C. God's gracious concern for tiny man in the universe should humble us and amaze us 
at the same time. If you look at verses 3 and 4 together, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is humans, what are humans that you are mindful of us, the son of man that you care for him. So the word trans, the word translated mindful in verse four means to remember. And the word translated care means to pay attention. So David's basically saying, why should God even notice tiny man on a tiny planet in the midst of a vast universe? Why should God even remember that we are here or pay attention to us at all? Because David was considering the immensity of the universe. He is humbled and amazed at God's concern for tiny dirt man, as Dr. Tim would call him on the Bible project. And we should be too. We should be concerned too. So point number three, write this down on your phone or in your notes. Is anybody taking notes? God gave us a special place of honor in creation. And I think that Dr. Mike has touched on this in his sermons before, and maybe Pastor Brian. The remaining verses of this Psalm, Psalm 8, teach us something even more wonderful. Not only does God notice us and pay attention to us here on planet Earth, but God gave us a special place of honor in creation. So let's look at verses 5 and 6. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. Sub point A, God made humans a little lower than the heavenly beings. First, saying that, the word translated heavenly beings is a plural word for God that we saw back in Genesis 1.1. So it can refer either to the angels of heaven or it can refer to the one true God. It's hard to determine what David means here, but he has left both meanings open for us to interpret and understand. So what does it mean that God made us a little lower than himself or the angels? David is simply saying that we are earthly creatures. We live here on the earth. We were made out of dirt, out of dust, and God and the angels are spiritual. They're heavenly beings. We are made lower than the heavenly beings, but notice only a little lower. That means that humans are significant in the universe. Subpoint B. God crowned us with glory and honor. That is brought out even more in the next description. So listen, listen. God crowned humans with glory and honor. He, God, created man and woman last as the very pinnacle of his creation, the most important aspect of his creation. And how did he crown us with glory and honor? The Bible tells us that God created man in his own image, Genesis 1:27. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. What great honor could God bestow upon specific numbers of his creation than to create them in his own image? Yes, mankind is tiny in this universe. But we are significant. We are only a little lower than the heavenly beings. And we have been crowned with the glory and the honor of the image of God. You guys, we are image bearers of the very image of God. We carry his image because we have Jesus in our hearts. When we walk out of our front door, we carry the image of Christ with us. This is why we are important in creation. And sub point C, God made us ruler over all creation. So as if that wasn't enough that he made us in his image, David goes on to remind us that we rule over all creation. We're talking about the book of Genesis here. As David writes in Psalm 8, you made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and all that swim the paths of the sea. I wonder what those things are all that swim the paths of the sea. God made humans ruler over all of creation. Still think you're insignificant? 
keep listening. We read in Genesis 2.15, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now the verbs here are very significant. I tell you, when I was in school as a child, I did not understand why it was important to know so much about grammar. But now that I'm working in other languages, I really, really do. So listen, the word translated work is the Hebrew word for serve. Now we've heard that word a time or two in our sermons, in our classes, in our Bible. The word translated take care is a word that means to keep, to guard, to watch over, or to protect. In other words, man is not to be a tyrant ruler over creation, but a servant leader over creation. God gave humans stewardship of all the earth to serve the land and take care of it under God's care. God gave us both rulership and responsibility. So a little side note here, the next time you decide to put a piece of plastic or an aluminum can in the trash, recycle it. God gave us stewardship. An even more extreme version of this view, view would be a type of environmentalism that worships the planet instead of God who creates the planet. But we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to worship the creator, not the planet. And the last part of Psalm 8, it's important for us to note that these final verses are applied specifically to Jesus in the New Testament. And if you see, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and 27 and Hebrews 2, 5 through 9, we've been crippled in our attempts to fulfill our rightful place in the world because of sin. But Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, he came as the perfect son of God and perfect son of man to deliver us from sin and to lead us one day to our rightful place as rulers over all creation. Jesus, you guys, he came to restore creation to its original glory and then give it back to us. This time, we'll do it right, not because of ourselves, but because of Jesus. This time, we'll be faithful stewards of God's creation, rejoicing in the gifts of creation and returning those gifts in thanksgiving and praise back to God. That, in fact, is your individual place in this world. Using the gifts that God has given you to serve God in this world and to bring Him glory. So when you say you're insignificant, when you say you don't have a place in this world, no, it's not true. God has a place for you in this world. Your individual place in this world is to use the gifts that God has given you to serve him in this world and bring him glory. That's it. He gave you gifts. Your responsibility is to use them to worship him and to bring him glory. And we do that through Jesus. So what is our place in this world? We are under God and over the world. So what is our response in all this? Number one, we should be awestruck at God's majesty in creation. Go when you can to a place where you can see his creation. And instead of taking pictures and storing them on your cell phone or the Flickr or the YouTube or the Facebook, worship God worship him for the majesty of his creation. This is how David begins and ends this psalm. Number two, we should be amazed at God's love and concern for us. David looked at the beautiful vastness of the heavens, says, looked at that and said, my God, look at what you have created and yet you care for tiny dirt man. Number three, we should seek to be good and faithful stewards over God's creation. He has given us rulership and responsibility. And as Christians, we have to be wise rulers over the beautiful creation God has given us. And I'm going to add a number four here. 
because of God's beautiful creation and the vastness of it and how he has asked us to co-partner with him in this thing called life. Do it with all of your glory, guys. Do it with all of your might, all of your strength, everything you are, everything you have. Go and share Jesus with people who do not know him. You can do it with words. You can do it with service. You can do it with a smile. You can do it with kindness. You could do it with acts of kindness. You can do it by being mindful of others in your midst. However God calls you to do it, just do it. Amen.